Thank you so much to Peter Van Praag for bringing us all together here and for the conviction and the passion that you imbue this event with every year with your um, deep devotion to the importance of democracy and liberty. Uh, my name is Louisa Savage. I am executive editor for Growth at Politico, and we are very proud to be a media partner on this event. Um, we are covering it in detail in a number of our newsletters, so please we invite you to read National Security Daily, Morning Defense, and Ottawa Playbook. Uh, it's a great honor for us to be here as we are growing our operations as an independent news organization uh, in the United States, in Europe, in the UK, and here in Canada. Um, so what a moment for all of us to gather uh, as we stand here at the cusp of what Peter's called a new era, both for the United States and for the world. And I cannot think of anyone better capable of helping us navigate what lies ahead and to set the stage for this weekend than two prominent senators, both former governors, who have served as the leading force for, I think, five years uh, of the United States congressional delegation here at Halifax. They're very unique. They have this very strong bipartisan working relationship and respect between the two, which I think ought to serve as a model for many more people in Washington. Um, and so um, it's fortuitous that in the next Congress, they are expected to hold the most senior positions on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as chairman and ranking member. So thank you for being here and welcome Senator um, thank you. Jim Risch thank from you. Idaho and Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire. There's obviously so much to talk about, um, but I'll just jump in with the question on everyone's minds. Now that the heated rhetoric of the campaign is behind us. Mostly. And, mostly, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and, you know, our allies are here together to hear from you, uh, really for your candid um, and clear-eyed analysis of where America goes next, America's role in the world. What do you expect America's role in the world to look like under a new administration and a new Congress? And I'd love to hear um, from both of you as, as senators um, what you expect from Senator Marco Rubio as the incoming Secretary of State. And I'd like to invite Senator Risch to start um, since you're representing the, the Republican side of the House. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, let me say I apologize. First, I'm not nearly as prepared as I should be. I got this and I was advised I was going to be on a panel invited, entitled The New Eras Arrive. And I'd read that Taylor Swift was bringing her tour here. <laughs> so I expected to be on a panel with Taylor Swift. But I'm, gl I'm well, glad to have you, Gene. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, look, this is a, uh, th that's a pretty general question uh, to start with. Uh, I, I guess I'll start with Marco Rubio. Mar Marco is the closest friend I have. In fact, I was a uh, national surrogate for him when he ran for president in 2016, which I might say that President Trump reminds me of every time we get into a heated discussion. Uh, but um, uh, he is a good friend of mine, a close personal friend. He sits next to me on the... Uh, uh, Intelligence Committee. I'm the senior Republican on that as well as Foreign Relations and he sits next to me on the Foreign Relations Committee. Um, we have very common ideas about foreign relations uh, and those uh, matter, related matters. And, and so, um, look, I, I, was, I was just delighted when I, I thought possibly he was going to get the tap for Vice President. Uh, that didn't work, but uh, I was delighted that uh, President uh, uh, Trump took him as uh, uh, as Secretary of State, I have absolutely, in fact, there's only one person in the United States Senate I'd have more confidence in than uh, him to get in that position out of the 100 people. Uh, that's myself, of course. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm, I'm enthusiastic ab about Marco, and uh, we're going to do our best, and Gene and I have talked about this, uh, we're going to do our best to have him confirmed as Secretary of State on the same day as the President is, uh, is inaugurated. So, so we'll move forward in that regard. Um, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, President Trump has ideas on foreign relations and uh, national security and that sort of thing, which every head of state does. Uh, he expects uh, that the people that he appoints, and 
appoints people that uh, he believes will uh, uh, enact those kinds of things and support his policies. The, the, uh, the national media in the United States is, is just, they're, they're all spun up, with all due respect to political, of course, uh, is all spun up about, uh, gosh, he's, he, he's appointing these people that are loyalists. Well, duh. Uh, who would you expect to appoint? Someone who's not loyal? Uh, uh, governor, I suspect, when you were governor like I was, the list I had was pretty much made up of people who were loyal to me. And if they said they weren't, they wouldn't be on the list. So, so don't be surprised at that. Um, uh, I, I guess, I don't know if you want me to talk about the well, Ukraine. I don't know yeah, if so you, you, you want to turn this into where, where does I Ukraine think, go? I think that's yeah, the I think elephant the in the room here that we talk about. That everyone wants to hear is, yeah. you know, President Trump has said he would negotiate an end to the war in Ukraine before he even is inaugurated. On the first day. Right. On the first day. Um, and you, know, you heard Peter say earlier, there can be no real peace until Russia is out of Ukraine. Um, so what do you think are the chances that, that the US will stand with Ukraine until victory, or will Trump seek to give part of Ukraine to um, Putin and move on? Yeah. Look, I, I know uh, President Trump well. I consider him a friend. Uh, worked with him incredibly closely in his uh, first term. I expect to work with him incredibly uh, closely in his second term. During the campaign, uh, he was, uh, first of all, they're, they're, to know Donald Trump, you have to understand, this man hates war. He, he is uh, moved any time a United States serviceman or woman is lost, one. He, he has incredible understanding of what war really means, he does not want war, he wants peace. Uh, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I say that as my judgment, I'm not speaking for him. Uh, nobody speaks for, uh, for President Trump, but uh, uh, he said that, uh, for, first of all, and I, and I agree with him 100% when he said that invasion would have never happened if he remained, if he'd have gotten a second term, I believe that. But now he's gonna be handed this as he starts his second term, and uh, he has said, I'm going to end that on the first day in office. Now, I believe that's a euphemism for this is very high uh, priority for me. I, I think he probably will do some things that, uh, a as he starts uh, before he takes that first uh, uh, day in office, or maybe he could do it the first day in office, but he has this as a high priority. This is a man who, when he says he's going to do something, you really ought to listen to him because he has a tremendous history of accomplishing what he sets out to do. He says he's going to end this war. Now I know all of you are saying, well, how is that gonna happen? And I have ideas on that. I know he has ideas on that and others do. Um, but he has a way of negotiating with people and talking with people to get things done. Well, in one minute, I, can you tell us your view, like on what the way would be? No, no? and I'll tell you why. I, I don't want to step. I don't want to step on that uh, message. Um, I, I would say this: uh, th there's people that, that I've heard people that I laugh at say, "Oh, well, you know, uh, Trump's just in the pocket of Putin." Trump is in the pocket of no one, and uh, I, and I think uh, Putin knows that. Uh, I, I would say this: when Putin gets that phone call, and he will. He needs to listen very, very carefully to what President Trump lays out for him. Uh, the last thing he wants to do is to get on the wrong side of President Trump. President Trump will do his best uh, to bring this to a conclusion. We all know wars end when both sides either, uh, one side completely defeats the other militarily or the other side, uh, or, or both sides get tired of fighting. Uh, we, we're uh, at a place where it is time to talk about this, and uh, President Trump is going to talk about this, and I would strongly urge the parties that are involved in that to listen carefully to what he has to say. My view, as far as the war is concerned now, Russia has already lost this war. Ukraine hasn't won it, but Russia has lost it. They set out to do two things. They set out to invade, to take Kyiv, to set up a puppet government, and then occupy the country virtually like, they, like they're doing in Belarus. That was their, their objective. They did not get that done. They will never get that done. The brave people of Ukraine have said, you will never do that. 
and, and I believe them. I've, I've talked to a lot of them, and when they say they'll fight to the death to protect their country, I believe that. At the same time, everybody, listen, everybody needs to listen to President Trump when he says, what do we need to do to get this done? That's what I have to say. Senator Sheen, do you share that, I guess, optimism, um, or do you have a different expectation? Well, clearly the Ukrainians are going to have to um, weigh in on sure. what happens there. And so I think, as Peter said so eloquently, that we all, all of us in democracies, owe a debt of gratitude to the courageous Ukrainians for standing up to Vladimir Putin. You know, um, I really appreciated the opening video this afternoon because I got to go to the 80th anniversary of Normandy this year. I had never been to Normandy. My father fought in World War II. I lost an uncle in World War II. And to see the veterans who were still there, age from 97 to 107, and to listen to the leaders, the allies who fought that war. Because that, to me, was the message that came out of Normandy, that came out of this video that Minister Blair talked about. It is that idea of collective defense. Um, the United States has an important role. But what has made us so strong is our allies, our ability to put together a coalition and to work together. And that clearly is going to weigh in prominently in what happens in Ukraine, in what happens in Taiwan, in what happens in the Middle East. Um, this is um, those of us who care about democracy, who believe that that's the right of people to be free, to enjoy freedom, um, working together are able to address these kinds of conflicts. Do you think that um, if the conflict were to become, come to an end with some territory you know, staying in Russia's hands, does that risk emboldening China, Iran, the crinks, as Peter calls him? I mean, how risky is that? Listen, there's no doubt that our adversaries are watching what happens in Ukraine. They're watching to see if we are going to make good on our commitments um, when we weigh in. They're watching to see. We know that um, President Xi in China is, has already looked at his timetable for Taiwan based on um, Ukraine. So uh, I think that's very important. One of the things that I think is most concerning um, that has happened as the result of the war in Ukraine is this uh, development with Iran and China and um, Russia and North Korea, where they're now all um, supporting Putin in his effort in Ukraine. And so make no mistake, they're going to they're looking at the outcome there. And I think we make a, a big mistake in NATO, in um, the free world, if we blink on this and say we are no longer going to support the Ukrainians in this effort. Um, Senator Rich, do you think uh, President Trump sees that connection? Well, no, no doubt he sees that, that connection. Look, I, I think that most people who work in this lane have come to the conclusion that I have. and. Uh, I watched what I said a year ago. I guess it was a year ago that uh, that you know it was concerning to have these bad guys come together. Look, if you're looking for a new era in the world, look for an era where you have what I call the no goodniks group and the and the good guys on the other side. You have democracies, uh, capitalist, free market, free people with high degree of sensitivity for human rights on one side, and on the other side, you have autocracies that are uh, socialist, communist governments. And, and those poles are coming closer and closer and tighter together. I think the challenge of the 21st century is we've got to figure out how to live on this planet together without killing each other. Armed conflict is not is not a good resolution now, nor has it ever been, but especially now because of nuclear weapons uh, and everything else. So 
We ought to agree on some lines that we're not going to cross. You know, we, we call it the United Nations. We're not united anymore. We never were united. We certainly aren't united now because of this polarity of our values are very different. And neither side is going to change. So the first thing we ought to agree on is that no country is going to try to invade or take over another country. By the way, that was the foundation of the United Nations. And the United Nations is sitting here. They can't even pass a resolution condemning this, for crying out loud. Um, we, there, there needs to be a rethinking of this and a rethinking that, yeah, we are different. Yeah, we do have uh, different views uh, of life. But imperialism can't be, can't be part of either side's calculus. It really can't. Or we got, we got bad, bad troubles ahead of us. But I think one of the things that's important here is that there's tremendous bipartisan support for those sentiments. Um, you know, Donald Trump's election has been presented as, oh, you know, foreign policy is going to go way over here, and what's the United States going to do? But the reality is support for Ukraine, um, support to address the pacing threat from China, um, those are strong bipartisan values that we agree on. So I, I think the suggestion that um, things are going to change so dramatically is not entirely true because Congress is an independent branch of government. And right now, um, there's a lot of bipartisan support for the foreign policy values that Jim talked about, that I talked about, and that um, we're talking about being here in this forum. You know, I want to agree violently <laughs> with what my uh, Not too colleague uh, just said. Uh, this is a bipartisan issue, and there is a lot of agreement. You will see people, you heard a little bit of it on the screen here, that are dissidents in that regard. We're a democracy. People uh, do uh, say things differently than that. There is a view of some people differently than what we have or what uh, Gene uh, just expressed. When somebody utters that, it gets a tremendous amount of ink. It gets a tremendous amount of coverage, and people start overweighting that as to what the view in the United States is. It isn't. What I think Gene described is about as well as can possibly describe that we are a nation that has different views, but fundamentally, our values are very much the same. Well, one of the people who has different views, um, You know, it's interesting, you, you sit on the Senate Intelligence Committee, right, and, and you've worked I on do. issues of disinformation by foreign adversaries. I even read that this summer you introduced legislation to stop foreign influence on land and energy policy uh, by preventing the Bureau of Land Management's electronic public comment system from being sabotaged by foreign adversaries and AI bots, which I thought was fascinating. Um, there's no question we're in the middle of information wars, disinformation wars, that this is shaping public opinion in many countries. Um, so given all that, the nominee for Director of National Intelligence. I know where this is going, by the way. Tulsi Gabbard. But finish your question. Well, I mean, <laughs> she's been criticized for openly echoing what many people consider the Kremlin line on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and blaming it on NATO. Her TV comments get amplified on Russian state media. And this would, in this role, she would be controlling the brief, the intelligence brief that the president gets, right? I'm just wondering if you have concerns about her taking on that role, overseeing US intelligence, and, and what criteria do you think your colleagues in the Senate should apply to uh, assessing that nomination? Yeah, I, I think, uh, first of all, let me say, we have 17 intelligence agencies uh, in in the United States. And there are thousands of people, tens of thousands of people that work in intelligence. Those intelligence agencies, by the way, told us that the Ukraine war would last three days, maybe three weeks at the most, okay? All but one of them. One of them said, eh, not so fast. But 16 of the 17 said that. But there, there are thousands of people involved in that. I, I wouldn't focus on one person. Um, we, uh, we here in the Intelligence Committee, we don't have a person come in that controls the information to us. Uh, it, is, it is through these diff 17 different intelligence agencies. And that's going to be, that's going to continue, that's not going to change. Within those intelligence, with, within the intelligence agencies and those thousands of people, again, you have a, a, a variety of thought. But uh, I am not concerned that uh, a person 
is going to influence the president to the point where uh, he changes his basic view on things. Mm. On the issue of the nomination, Senator Shaheen, uh, last time we spoke on a panel at Halifax, it was about women and girls in Afghanistan. And you have been a champion for women's rights around the world. Um, and also, as a senior member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, you were important in its adoption of reforms on the Uniform Code of Military Justice to address sexual assault in the military. You'll be voting on the confirmation of the nominee for Secretary of Defense. Pete Hexbeth, and he has said that he is against women serving in combat roles. He is also facing a sexual assault allegation that was made against him according to an unsealed police report. And I know a lot goes into these confirmations, but I'm wondering on those specific points, what message do you think that appointment would send to the women uh, in the armed forces? Well, we have a process. There will be a hearing. There will be an opportunity to ask questions <coughs> of the nominee. And hopefully, there will be a background check done that will um, uncover whether there are any other concerns. I think we need to say very clearly to women in the United States, we would like those women who are interested, who um, meet the qualifications, to join the military. Right now, about 18% of our military are women. Um, we are not meeting our recruitment goals as it is. Um, if women think they can't participate fully in our military, take on combat roles, that's going to have an impact on what women are willing to join our military. That's going to have a significant impact on our readiness, on our ability to do the mission of the men and women in the armed services. And I think that will be very clearly asked at the hearing for Mr. Hegseth. Um, I think the issue of sexual assault, as we've heard some other senators refer, um, is a concern in our military. It's one that we have not fully addressed yet. We've taken a number of steps. There's a lot of um, effort to do something about that. The intent, and everybody understands how important that is, but it hasn't been fully addressed yet. Um, I don't think having somebody who has a questionable record on that issue is um, a message to the women of the military that we want to send or the women of the country that we want to send. But again, I think we've got we've to follow through on the process that we have. Um, I, am, I believe that the committee is going to ask those questions. I certainly intend to ask some of those questions. I think we also have a management issue within the Department of Defense. It's, um, it's our biggest um, department within the United States government, the most um, people serving there. Um, we need to make sure that whoever is in charge there has um, the ability to um, address the um, cooperation and collaboration that needs to happen within that department. And um, I certainly agree there are some changes that need to be made. I would bet that everybody here representing the United States military would agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, Your colleague, Senator um, Kramer, uh, said in an interview with Politico he should retract those comments to get confirmed. Do you agree with that, Senator Risch, on women in combat? Uh, the women in combat situation? Look, the, the, I think it's delusional for anybody to not agree that women in combat creates certain unique situations that have to be dealt with. I think the jury's still out on how to do that. I'm, I'm not a military person. I, uh, I rely on the military uh, to handle those kinds of things. What I demand of the military is that they focus on the number one job they have, and that is winning if indeed we get into combat. So I'm, I'll, uh, I'll leave that to them to, to sort that out. On the last uh, two seconds we have here, um, we're in Canada. Um, which was a founding member, a member of NATO, of course, um, and Canada's also hosting this weekend the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Um, Congressman Mike Turner, who is heading the U.S. delegation there, told my colleague, um, in no uncertain terms, that there would be no NATO if other countries spent the way Canada does on defense. Very critical um, of Canada's spending, not to the 2% level. We heard from uh, Minister Blair, Canada's working on it, doing more. Um, 
there's some discussion here about what should the focus of Can Canada's military spending be. Uh, Professor Stein um, has written a paper arguing it should be on the Arctic. Um, Minister Blair was talking about the Arctic today. Do you think that is kind of where Canada can make the biggest impact for collective security is, is in the Arctic, or do you think it's somewhere else, Indo-Pacific or any other place? You know, that, that's a really good question. Break it into two parts. First, first the good news. Uh, the United States is negotiating with Canada, Dis not negotiating as much as discussing with Canada uh, how they should spend, where they should spend, getting the biggest bang for the buck. That's the good news. Good discussions. Uh, not really a lot of dissent uh, on either side. Let's go to the bigger question, and that is the dollar amount. Uh, that statement that was made wasn't uh, about the that NATO would be in a tough place if Canada didn't, if everybody spent like Canada does. Um, that wasn't very diplomatic. Unfortunately, it was true. Uh, it, it is a hard thing to look our friends in the eye and say, look, folks, we all made an agreement. We're all in this together. NATO is the strongest, most successful, the best military alliance in the history of the world. Putin found that out. He didn't think that was going to be the case, I believe, when he, he did the invasion. He thought it would split NATO. NATO today is stronger than it has ever been. The commitment is stronger than it ever been. Uh, we have a couple of recalcitrants, which we beat about the head and shoulders uh, unmercifully every time I get the opportunity. Uh, we've added two really, really strong members. Gene and I both worked on that and pushed that very hard. Um, but uh, look, we made a deal. Let's all pull together. Now, with all due respect, my good friends from Canada, I will say, uh, they say, well, we're working on this. And so we say, what does that mean? They say, well, you know, we're kind of looking at 2032. I do not speak for the President of the United States, the President-elect of the United States. If he were in this room, you would get a very large guffaw from him on talking about 2032. Um, it, it's it's got to be better than that. It truly, truly has to be better than that. We love Canada. It's our closest ally. It's our border. It's our cousins. It's our our friends. But we made the deal. Let's let's do the deal. Senator Shaheen. Um, yes, I think it's it's positive that we now have a firm commitment from Canada that they're going to try and um, increase defense spending, and we've seen some progress on that. We had a very good discussion last year with Minister Blair on the need to increase defense spending. Uh, I think Arctic would be a very positive place to um, address the challenges that we're going to face there because we're seeing the incursion by Russia and China into the Arctic. It's a problem um, for Canada. It's a problem for the United States. It's a problem for all of the countries that border the Arctic. And we better get busy and recognize that's a challenge that we need to start addressing. Let me put a fine point on this to end it. And that is, when President Trump took office the first time around, there were three of the 30 nations that were making their 2%. Today, because of his pressure, uh, there, we're up to only a handful now that aren't doing the 2%. And one of them is Canada. And I can tell you, Gene and I both deal with the Europeans all the time. And there are a lot poorer countries and a lot of countries that are in more difficult financial position than Canada is that are stepping up and doing the 2% right now. We need to all get on board. Well, thank you. Um, on that note, I think we're out of time, but what a great way to begin. So many ideas for us to continue to um, think about and talk about for the rest of the weekend. Thank you, both thank of you, you, for your insight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.